Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Prasad, and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Robert Van Voren. Uh, Robert is a Sovietologist, and he teaches Soviet and post-Soviet studies at three former Soviet republics. He's also the chief executive of an organization called Human Rights in Mental Health, which was formerly known as Global Initiative on Psychiatry. He's also an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and possibly the youngest person uh, in its history to be an honorary fellow. Um, the reason we're talking to Robert, and we have many excellent reasons for talking to him, but he has published a recent paper in the journal International Psychiatry, uh, which is a journal um, that, that is uh, linked with the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And his paper is about a very interesting subject, which is about the resumption of political abuse uh, of psychiatry in the Soviet Union, or, or Russia, the former Soviet Union. But for, before we talk about what's happening right now in Russia, um, let's talk a bit about the past, because I think a lot of people have forgotten or don't really realize how psychiatry was abused in the former Soviet Union. So Rob, tell us a bit about that. Well, the abuse of psychiatry in the Soviet Union started basically uh, after Stalin in the 1950s. Uh, one of the reasons was that uh, the then leader of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev, said, that, well, we have no political prisoners anymore. But of course, he had political prisoners, so the uh, alternative was to say, well, they're all mentally ill. People who go against the communist state, about against this you know, bright future for everybody, uh, there must be something wrong about them. And this kind of coincided with a uh, total uh, monopoly which was uh, imposed on Soviet psychiatry. There was only one school which was uh, permitted, which was the Moscow School of Psychiatry, uh, which was very biological, Pavlovian-oriented. And the leader of this uh, Moscow School, uh, Andrei Snezhnyevsky, a member of the Academy of Sciences, um, very much developed this concept of sluggish schizophrenia. Uh, which is this kind of, uh, well, as he described, it's a, a, a schizophrenia, which is very dangerous, uh, but people themselves don't realize they have it. The environment doesn't realize they have it. Their family doesn't realize they have it. But the only way to treat this is uh, compulsory uh, treatment in a closed psychiatric hospital. And signs of sluggish schizophrenia were struggle for the truth, uh, reform delusions, uh, uh, religious hallucinations, uh, perseverance, uh, you know, actually all the things which fit a dissident in the Soviet Union. So it's a system which started to develop uh, very much uh, organized by the KGB, as we now understand. Uh, we know more or less uh, how the system worked. Uh, it was a small team in Moscow who determined basically where a political prison would go to, uh, either to camp or to psychiatric hospital. And uh, according to our data, about one out of three uh, political prisoners wound up in psychiatric hospital. Uh, so we are talking about uh, thousands of people who were declared mentally ill. Uh, this is the, the core of the problem. Uh, what happened next to it is that within such an environment, um, uh, deviant behavior, you could say, uh, or not uh, socially adapted behavior became a sign of mental illness. So uh, millions of people actually wound up on the psychiatric register in the Soviet Union. Uh, at the, in 1988, there are figures that up to 10 million people in the Soviet Union were psychiatrically registered, which meant that they uh, could be called to come to a dispenser, uh, could be forced to take medication, uh, they lost their, uh, their, their political rights, they could not vote. Uh, so, you know, the, a large portion of society was actually excluded from society because of a so-called mental, mental disorder. Um, and this is something which, in a way, uh, the political abuse of psychiatry came to an end. Uh, well, because the Soviet Union came to an end. Uh, we had several cases in other Soviet republics in the 1990s, uh, at the beginning of the century, but the whole mentality of Soviet psychiatry very much continued after the Soviet Union, and in particular in Russia and in Central Asian republics. And so there we see the, the basis on the basis of which this abuse is now uh, kind of being resumed. But um, you, you're, you're painting a picture of thousands of people inhabiting large numbers of psychiatric hospitals who are basically political dissidents, um, but have been labeled as mentally ill. So. When um, the Soviet Union ended, and uh, what, what happened to all those people? Well, in, the, in 1988, 1989, there was this drive to uh, take people off the psychiatric register. 
So uh, literally millions and millions of people were kind of declassified as mentally ill. Uh, but uh, large portions of the population of psychiatric hospitals remained in psychiatric hospitals because, uh, you know, you have these psychiatric hospitals for the kind of the, the short-term uh, uh, treatment, uh, short-term meaning in ordinary psychiatric hospitals up to three months, sometimes six months, sometimes a year, sometimes two years. Uh, in special psychiatric hospitals, in prison psychiatric hospitals uh, like Broadmoor uh, uh, and Rampton, uh, up to 10 years, 15 years, sometimes 20 years, uh, but chronic uh, people with chronic mental illness or with mental disability would wind up in internats, uh, which are you know uh, euphemistically called social care homes, but in fact it's 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 prisons where people are are uh, locked up, and the only way they get out is horizontally. And as far as we can assess, there are still about half a million people living in these internats in the former Soviet Union. So you know this is the, the situation there is really horrendous. Uh, very often in the uh, news you have these reports that there has been a fire in some nursing home uh, in central Russia and uh, 20 people or 80 people died. These are not nursing homes. We have a totally different image of a nursing home. You know, these are big coffins where people are locked up and, and basically there is no treatment whatsoever. And the living conditions are usually uh, horrendous. So in a way, the fact that people burn to death is, is for them a release. You know, their, their lives in this uh, horrible env environment have, uh, have ended. And, and those people are being mislabeled as psychiatrically ill as well when they're dissident? There is a, uh, a, bit, a vast grey area. Uh, of course, there are people who are uh, chronically schizophrenic. There are people who are uh, mentally handicapped uh, uh, in all stages. But there are also lots of people who just don't fit in society or who uh, lost track, as it were. You know, they, they lost their job or they lost their family. Uh, they became what you call in Russian marginali, uh, marginals. Uh, people on the outskirts of society, and uh, society doesn't like this. Because the old concept from Soviet times that, you know, a Soviet man had to be complete, a Soviet man had to be productive. So in the Soviet Union, uh, there were no disabled. You didn't see disabled people. They were just kept out, out of public sight. Um, people who were not, you know, fitting in society were uh, ostracized from society, and part of them wound up in these internati. It's, it's very interesting. We now have uh, quite a lot of documents from uh, uh, Soviet times. Uh, there is, for instance, this report that Andropov sent to the Politburo uh, in uh, 1973. And he, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, basically from him, it's a cover letter of a report which came in from Krasnodarsky Krai, one of the KGB generals there. And he writes that he has this uh, large number of people uh, who are seriously mentally ill, and need uh, to have psychiatric treatment. And he comes to a total of 12,000 people. And he says, well, you know, I have a big problem because I have only 3,700 beds. So we need more hospitals. Well, you know, we, we need more beds. And then he lists what kind of people these are. And these are people who try to flee the country, who try to meet with foreigners, uh, who claim that there should be control mechanisms over the Communist Party, uh, who have been writing anti-Soviet leaflets. So dissidents, basically. 12,000 only in Krasnodarsky Krai. And Don Andropov writes to the Politburo in, in Moscow and says, well, you know, uh, we need to build more psychiatric hospitals. And if we now look in uh, Russian or the former Soviet psychiatric hospitals, in most of them you will see that new buildings have been put up in 1974, 1975. This is the, the result of this, you know, this campaign by Andropov. Uh, and of course, these buildings were not only used for dissidents, but also for dissidents. Uh, there are basically no psychiatric hospitals where there were no uh, people interned for political reasons. What was the reaction of psychiatrists outside of the Soviet Union um, to the reports that, that psychiatry was being used as a political weapon? Initially, very reluctant. Uh, you know, they immediately said, well, this is politic, uh, p politics. We are not dealing with politics. We, you know, we are not going to discuss this. There was a big pressure from the Soviet Union one of the members of the executive committee of the World Psychiatric Association was a Soviet uh, professor, Marat Vartanyan, uh, who we now know was a, not even an informer of the KGB, he was an actual KGB agent with a very modest uh, um, uh, name, uh, Professor, uh, which he <laughs> gave himself, he very much liked himself. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why they were so reluctant is 
Uh, there were uh, within the WPA also psychiatrists from Latin American countries. By WPA, you mean the World Psychiatric, the World Psychiatric Association. Association? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, from Latin American countries, from South Africa, uh, countries where there was also a uh, uh, political abuse, but of a different type. Right in South Africa, uh, the level of the quality level of uh, services for white people and black people were, were, you know, it was light years away from each other. Uh, in Latin American countries where we had the dictatorships, um, psychiatrists were used in order to uh, sophisticate torture. So psychiatrists were participating in torture ses sessions and then telling the torturers how to better torture the, patient, the, the, the people uh, in order to make it more effective. So my assumption is that a lot of them, you know, didn't want to discuss Soviet psychiatric abuse because they understood if we now discuss today Soviets, uh, maybe tomorrow will be the, the, the next. So it took, uh, well, um, the first time it was discussed in 1971, then in 1977 it was condemned, and only in the 1980s it really became an issue um, uh, within the world psychiatric community. And the interesting thing is that a lot of the ethical codes which were, you know, uh, written and adopted by uh, national and international psychiatric bodies were adopted as a result of the Soviet issue. And so in that sense, it very much helped, I think, world psychiatry to focus more on medical ethics, uh, on the uh, responsibilities of physicians and on human rights in, in, in mental health. So you're kind of saying that the rest of the world... Um, psychiatrists in the rest of the world only really began to do something about this in a small way in the 70s and they got more mobilized in the 80s but this had been going on since the 50s is that right yeah yep. Yep. the first cases that came out are is the beginning of the 1960s um, then but it had been happening before that you think it ha yeah well it, it the in in uh, in stalinist times uh, in the 1930s 1940s um, a lot of people wound up in psychiatric hospital in order to save them from the ordeal of going to the gulag. Right? So it's, it's a different type of abuse of psychiatry. Uh, psychiatrists were defending, actually, uh, people from having been sent to, to Siberia. It's a bit like what happened in Poland. A lot of the uh, Solidarność act, uh, activists who were arrested uh, or were threatened with arrest after martial law was imposed in 1981, they uh, kind of disappeared in psychiatric hospitals so they didn't have to go to prison. Um, but then it all changed in the mid-1940s. Uh, uh, 48 is, is one of those dates when the whole atmosphere and institution started to change. Uh, and for instance, the um, Estonian president, uh, Pats, uh, who was president of independent Estonia between the two world wars, uh, he also wound up in psychiatric hospital. He was in, in the special psychiatric hospital in Kazan. So it's... Um, uh, it took a long time before Western psychiatrists started to acknowledge that there was indeed a problem. Yeah, there is this kind of blanket of secrecy or of silence over, over the issue. You've explained very, very well, um, very coherently, why some countries um, where psychiatry, some, some psychiatrists are behaving in a more dubious manner might be reluctant to criticize the Soviet Union. I still don't get why the US and the UK and Western Europe, for example, psychiatrists there were so reluctant. Because, um, well, as it's, it's, I think it's there, there's this uh, collegial feeling uh, of defending each other. Uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, you always talk about the closed ivory tower of medicine. I think within the closed ivory tower of medicine, there is this one little tower which is even higher up and even more closed, which is the, the tower where the psychiatrists are sitting, right? I can say so easily because I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, it takes a long time to uh, make them understand and realize that their profession is, uh, you know, turned into a tool of, of torture because we're talking, we're seriously talking about torture. Uh, uh, it's a treatment of people with uh, massive doses of drugs, uh, polypharmia, uh, but then also outright torture, uh, beatings, uh, uh, you know, all, all kinds of, of, of stuff which, uh, which can only be classified uh, uh, as torture. And to accept that somebody is actually using the medical profession for such purposes, I think is very, very, very difficult for a physician to, to, to accept. But it happened, and it still happens. The other thing that I find difficult to get my head around in terms of this Soviet abuse of psychiatry, I'm not, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but the thing that I find slightly peculiar, and I'm going to paint a picture for you now in terms of a psychiatrist encountering a patient. 
let us say the patient is a dissident or rebellious. If he gets carted off to see a psychiatrist, all he has to do, if he's an intelligent person, I would have thought, is in the presence of the psychiatrist, just deny all knowledge of any dissident behaviour. Just just um, recant on the dissident stuff. And then when you leave the room of the psychiatrist, carry on printing your leaflets or stuff or whatever it is that you're up to. So the, 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 the diagnostic tool in psychiatry is the clinical interview. And the interview, if you're intelligent and know a bit about psychiatry, it's possible um, to manipulate your way out of that kind of diagnosis. I can't go into too much detail. It's not possible to manipulate your way out of other other diagnoses. <laughs> but this one feels pretty pretty easy to manipulate your way out of. That's the thing I can't get. Yeah, but it's it's more complicated because uh, first of all, a lot of dissidents are you know they're a special type of people, so they're very stubborn. Okay. Uh, so if you believe A, I am not going to change my opinion because a psychiatrist maybe thinks that it's, 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 it's madness. Even for the right? purpose of staying out of a hospital? Even for the purpose of staying out okay. of a hospital. Okay. Uh, secondly, a lot of dissidents um, at first had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, there is even a manual written by uh, a psychiatrist, Emil Glusman, and a former political prisoner, uh, a tool for dissidents how to behave during interrogation by a psychiatrist. Right. To uh, avoid a diagnosis. To avoid a diagnosis. Okay. So, so yeah, it's sure this, yeah. yeah. Well, they, people tried. Okay. But then there is one thing which is uh, essential. You know, um, Soviet psychiatrists were cut off from world psychiatry. So uh, it, um, their understanding of psychiatry and uh, diagnostic concepts uh, changed over time more and more. It, it totally diverted from world psychiatry. And for psychiatrists, you know, somebody who is willing to uh, have an opinion uh, lose his job, lose his family, or have kids who cannot go to university because of his opinion, and keeps on saying that he has his opinion, in their view, this guy really has to be mentally ill. right? Uh, I, I knew, for instance, the director of the psychiatric hospital in Vinica. She was also the local party organizer in, in, the, in that region. And she told me that uh, when Gorbachev came to power in 1985 and she received the first papers from the party plenum, she was absolutely shocked because she was convinced that Gorbachev was suffering from sluggish schizophrenia. You know, all the things written in the papers were, you know, clear symptoms of, sl of, of sluggish schizophrenia. And she was convinced that he was mentally ill until the Soviet Union collapsed and Ukraine became independent. And she met psychiatrists from outside the Soviet Union. And then she realized that her, you know, concepts just were, were wrong. It's a, it's a very sophisticated you know, um, issue when you have a closed society and you can do whatever you want with, 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 the, with people's views and ideas. Hmm. Okay, but, but here's another problem from a Western psychiatrist standpoint, which is that if someone comes into the room and they express, let us, for argument's sake, some strange ideas, some strange religious ideas, right? As a psychiatrist, what you're meant to do is get other people from that person's community or shared cultural group and say to them, well, what do you think about this chap's ideas? And if they say, well... We, we, we within our circle share those ideas, um, then you're not meant to make a diagnosis of mental illness. In other words, the, the, the point is it's not the idea itself. It's w within a group of people, if that idea is shared, no matter how strange you might think it, then it's not a sign of an individual mental illness. It's a shared cultural outlook on the world. So the, the other thing I find difficult to get my head around is all these dissidents would have had to have done in Western psychiatry say, listen, there's a hundred of us who all believe the same thing. Even, even if it's causing us suffering, the fact there's a hundred other of us locally, or a thousand, or whatever, would immediately begin to mitigate against the possibility of a diagnosis in Western psychiatry. Yep, 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 yep. So, yeah. Well, I can give you two examples. One okay. is uh, in the 1980s, late 1980s, this Hare Krishna movement developed in the Soviet Union, in particular in, in Armenia. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the members of the Hare Krishna movement were diagnosed as being mentally ill and sent to psychiatric hospital. And so uh, one of my friends, he's now dead in, uh, in Ukraine, a psychiatrist, uh, he was one of the psychiatrists who diagnosed them as mentally ill. Right? So uh, here we are, 1992, 1993. Uh, he's walking around with a book that we published, which was the bi Biographical Dictionary of Political Abuse of Psychiatry. And he is showing foreigners that his name is there as an abuser because he diagnosed them to be mentally ill. And I said, listen, Volodya, you shouldn't do that because people don't understand. No, he said, no, it's very important because I show that, you know, then I believed they were mentally ill. Now I believe they were not mentally ill. 
this sophistication didn't exist. Uh, you know, nobody asked the other Hare Krishna people whether these guys were. All of them were mentally ill. Very simple by by definition. Okay. Right? So um, another example, uh, one of the most uh, famous opponents of political abuse in psychiatry in the Soviet Union is this psychiatrist Anatoly Karyagin, uh, who was sentenced to 12 years in camp and then got another two years. And, you know, when he came to the West in 1987. He was a hero. He had a standing ovation at the uh, annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, traveled around uh, giving lectures. And I remember he came to Amsterdam uh, about a month after he arrived in the West. And at a certain moment, I took him to a bar in, in Amsterdam, and there was this uh, uh, poster on the wall from the uh, patient movement in the Netherlands, which is a mirror. And then on the mirror is written, have you ever met a normal person, question mark, and did you like it? Right? So he asked me, what, what is this poster about? And so I translate. I said, I, I don't understand. I said, well, uh, Tolia, listen, uh, there is a broad uh, a, a range of people between uh, completely normal and, comp and, and, and mentally ill, right? Uh, who is normal? He said, well, that's clear. Either you're normal or you're mentally ill. I said, well, listen, Anatoly, uh, look, look out of the window. You know, Amsterdam, half of the population here is crazy. That's why it's such a wonderful city. And he just couldn't get to the point that, you know, uh, normality is a very kind of uh, fluctuating uh, uh, artificial notion, right? For him, it was very clear, either you're this or you're that. So he was, even being a dissident, he was a product of Soviet psychiatry, where there is no sophistication. It's either this or it's that. Um, and if you now look at this resumption of political abuse of psychiatry in Russia, um, you see that they started to become, you know, it's 21st century abuse. So it's more sophisticated than it was in Soviet times. What they now do is they put uh, uh, other diagnoses uh, on, on people. Uh, you know, it's uh, schizophrenia of the paranoid type. But like, for instance, with the ladies Pussy Riot, who were also diagnosed by psychiatrists, they have personality disorders. And then the, 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 the judge, being humane, says, well, you know, uh, you are uh, responsible and so you have to serve your term in, in prison. But at the same time, they are uh, dubbed as being people with a, you know, with a mental health problem. So they do both things. Uh, you, you still serve your term, but at the same time, you're crazy. Right? So we don't have to talk about your opinions or your views because there is something wrong with you. So you're arguing that there's a resurgence of uh, political abuse now? Yes, there is a very clear resurgence. It started um, at the beginning of the century. Uh, over the past four or five years, it has uh, increased uh, rapidly. Uh, most of it are individual cases, uh, very often in the provinces. Um, local authorities who send people to psychiatric hospital to scare them or to get rid of them. Uh, and it's mostly because of the repressive climate which has returned in, in, in Russia. But at the same time, we see more and more often that also the, the state is using uh, this method. Now, there is a very famous case, uh, Mikhail Kosenko. He is one of the people who participated in the demonstrations in Moscow in, 19, uh, in 2012, uh, was arrested. Is a guy um, who uh, he had a diagnosis of sluggish, of, of, uh, sluggish schizophrenia, actually. Uh, very unclear whether he actually has schizophrenia. He is a he, uh, kind of a withdrawn boy who was sent into the army, uh, clearly uh, severely bullied, which is a major problem in the Russian army. Uh, traumatized by this, comes back uh, unable to, uh, to develop you know, friendships, to get a job. So living at home uh, with his sister, quietly reading a lot, a uh, very eloquent uh, guy, and he goes out to this demonstration and by sheer coincidence winds up in the group where there is this uh, provocation of creating, you know, a struggle with the police. And there is this one short uh, piece of video where you see him pushing a policeman away because the policeman gets, gets too close. Uh, he's arrested, spends a year and a half in pretrial investigation in one of the worst Moscow prisons and is diagnosed to be, uh, well, schizophrenic, schizophrenic of the paranoid type. Uh, dangerous to himself and to his environment, and sent for compulsory treatment to a psychiatric hospital. So, you know, uh, thanks to protests, among others from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the guy is now out. He's still on compulsory treatment, but he's out and living with his sister again. And I think this is 
uh, in a way even, uh, you know, it's, it's a double abuse. First of all, uh, the whole case against him was fabricated. But secondly, here you have a guy who has a mental health problem, is stable, living in society, and you actually destroy his whole equilibrium, take him out of society, put him in prison for two years, and then you are kind of, uh, you know, shocked that uh, the guy has a difficulty of returning back to, uh, back to society. So it's, it's, it's totally against all the basic norms of, of mental health care, as they, as, they, as, as they should be. You seem to be arguing that the reason why the, the, there is a resurgence of political abuse of psychiatry is because there's a resurgence of dissidence. Or are you saying there's always has been dissidence or, or rebellion? It's just that the, the, the authorities have hit upon a new plan about how to deal with them. Yeah, I think the, the level of dissidence now is not much different than it was 10 years ago or five years ago. Uh, it's even less because people are, are scared. Uh, you know, the whole political climate in Russia is such that it's, it's much worse than under Brezhnev. Uh, it's, it's, it's very reminiscent of Soviet, of Stalinist times in the 1930s. Um, no, I think they're using psychiatry again uh, to scare people off. Uh, you know, it's a very simple thing. They're just you show, well, listen, you, you know, uh, camp is one thing, but you can also wind up in a psychiatric hospital. And it's again this whole uh, thing which was very, you know, important in Soviet times, you discredit people and people's opinions by saying that there's something wrong with them. Uh, we now have again a case in, in Russia. It's this uh, Ukrainian a female pilot uh, who was fighting on the Eastern Front as a volunteer. She was kidnapped and abducted into Russia, charged with murder. Uh, and she is now in the Serbsky Institute in Moscow to be diagnosed by a psychiatric commission. Right? And I think my, my presumption is that they will come out with the, uh, with the concept that she has a personality disorder. And then again, the same, you know, we, she will be put on trial, but at the same time, she has this rubber stamp of, you know, mentally ill on her forehead. Um, and it, it, it really scares people off because people understand what happened in Soviet times. It, it, it does work. Uh, so in most cases, they don't have to go ahead and put people behind bars for a long period. The other thing that's very difficult for a Western psychiatrist to understand about this is that, to be brutally frank, I mean, psychiatry, although obviously I think it's a very important subject, is very much at the margins of, of modern um, political discourse. Um, I would doubt the current Prime Minister of the UK knows much about psychiatry. And the very fact, very interestingly, actually, he was using the term psychopathic to refer to Islamic State is quite interesting. The, the use of psychiatric terminology uh, to label political enemies um, may not be that far away, actually, oddly enough, from what happens in the Soviet Union. But, but how come psychiatry came to play almost center stage uh, a role at the heart of Soviet society and now returning in Russian society as a way of understanding politics? Well, um, you know, I did a lot of research in this area in particular, um, I think uh, it's a um, kind of a convergence of several factors. Uh, one is uh, this Andrei Snezhnevsky, uh, who was, uh, uh, who agreed to allow his profession to be used by uh, the political regime uh, in exchange for basically uh, liberty to do whatever research he wanted. Uh, so, uh, you know, he sold his profession basically to the KGB. Uh, he was friends with the whole nomenclatura in, uh, in, in Moscow, and one of his friends was Yuri Andropov, who became chairman of the KGB in 1967. And Andropov uh, had as the main goal uh, the fight against what he called uh, ideological diversion. Right? So um, uh, he put one and two together. He had this very handy friend of his who was a psychiatrist who was working in the field of sluggish schizophrenia. He had needed a tool in order to fight against dissidents, and he just combined the two things. And he personally was leading the campaign of political abuse in psychiatry. I now know because I know um, a former general of the 5th Directorate of the KGB in Kiev, uh, which was the directorate dealing with dissidents, and so he explained to me the whole system, how, how, this, uh, how this was functioning. So it's, um, but, you know, uh, the Soviet Union was not the only country where this happened. Uh, there is massive political abuse of psychiatry in China, for instance, and it's still going on. And I think in, historically in China, it was even more widespread than in the Soviet Union. Um, and it's not by coincidence. Chinese psychiatry, especially forensic psychiatry, was developed in the 1950s 
by representatives of the Moscow School. So the students and the colleagues of Snezhenyevsky were traveling to Beijing to train Chinese psychiatrists in forensic psychiatry. So of course they took this whole concept along and they, you know, they in, in implemented it also in, uh, in the People's Republic of China. So what should be done to prevent this kind of thing happening? And I want to suggest maybe rather provocatively a, a possible solution, which is you should always be worried in any society if the psychiatrists and the official bodies that represent psychiatry are too cosy with the government. It should be the role of psychiatrists to defend their patients, but defend their patients against the state, not collaborate so much with the state or be seen as a tool of the state. So the best way to protect that is for psychiatrists to be in slight opposition uh, with the state, I'd like to argue. But what's your opinion? Yes, I fully agree. And I think uh, control mechanisms, uh, vigilance, uh, watchdogs are very important. Uh, we have one case of political abuse of psychiatry in the Netherlands, uh, which is very well known now. Uh, he was a social worker with the Ministry of Defense. Um, in the 19, late 1970s, a landmine explodes during an exercise. Uh, uh, draftees are killed. And he is told by the ministry to go to the widow of the uh, instructor who died as well and tell her that her husband was at fault. And the reason was very simple. This is Cold War. Uh, the Dutch army had faulty landmines and the Soviets were not supposed to know that our landmines are, 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 are faulty, right? So he goes to the widow and tells her that, you know, I've been told to tell this, but I know it's nonsense and I will help you to uncover the, the real truth. And the guy was uh, uh, examined four times by psychiatric commissions. Every time he was diagnosed to be not suffering from any mental disorder. And so the medical department of the Ministry of Defense took out the word not and dubbed him to be mentally ill. So, you know, to just sidetrack him. And it took him 17 years to be rehabilitated because the, you know, the structure uh, of the Ministry of Defense is uh, it's in a way almost as monolithic as the Soviet Union, right? It's also a very closed uh, uh, sector. So uh, to penetrate this and to make politicians kind of open up the, the, the valves uh, is extremely difficult. So I think you need in society uh, groups and, and people both within the governmental structure and non-governmental uh, organizations who all the time monitor, uh, monitor, uh, monitor this. Uh, and I think they're very important is the self-cleansing efforts of, of the psychiatric profession itself. You know, uh, that's, I think, one of the problems in a country like Russia. There is no self-cleansing anything. Uh, there is an ethical code. Nobody knows even the ethical code. There is a law on psychiatric help. People don't know the law on psychiatric help because there is no education in training people to use the law as it should be used. But we, there is a tension here, which is that psychiatrists, sometimes people, unfortunately, who get serious mental illness and go on the streets and direct the traffic and become a danger to themselves or other people, do need to be um, taken against their will to a psychiatric institution or hospital and given treatment. That does happen. And you do need the state to help you by giving you laws that allow you to do that. But there's a tension between that power that you need the state to give you and to ensure the state doesn't push you around and start telling you who to take off to the hospital. In other words, the independence of the profession from the state is extremely important, and people have to be vigilant for that. Yes, and, the, and this tension is always there. Uh, I mean, there is no way you can uh, eradicate this tension. I think it, actually the tension is very good because there is always a discussion, uh, you know, uh, should a person be hospitalized or not? Uh, do you have the right to hospitalize him if, if uh, he or she does not want to be hospitalized? You know, this border is a very kind of complex issue, uh, but it also keeps people vigilant to discuss this all the time. But then education becomes very important. Uh, you know, I think like, for instance, in China, the best way, uh, and I think also with Russia, I think the best way to end political abuse of psychiatry in these countries is now not like we did in the 1980s to try to kick them out of the World Psychiatric Association. Uh, I think education is essential. Uh, train people in understanding medical ethics, uh, train people in understanding their legislation, train people in uh, how do you deal with, you know, this conflict area. Uh, and you have all these modern uh, methodologies of, of training. You know, you don't have to have seminars right in the country itself. You can have apps, you have websites, uh, you can use all these modern methods uh, and reach out to the rank and file psychiatrists right in the province and allow them to understand what is happening outside. This isolation, which is so much the tool of uh, repressive regimes, 
uh, is something which is very limited now. Uh, even, uh, you know, uh, for instance, Facebook is banned in, in, in Vietnam, right? Uh, every Vietnamese, including the top leaders of the Communist parties, are on Facebook because they have a VPN. They have a false IP address, uh, which is registered somewhere in San Francisco or Texas or whatever. So, you know, you can bypass all these, these bans of, of the Internet. Uh, people are accessible. One final question. Anyone listening to this anywhere in the world, a, a member of the public or a doctor or a psychiatrist, what do you think they should do about this, this problem? And maybe the problem might occur in their country, but what should they do about the, the, the return of the political abuse of psychiatry in, the, in, in, in Russia or also that you've mentioned and flagged up China? Well, I think there are two things. One is uh, discuss it, uh, deal with it, um, try to understand what is happening. Uh, secondly, make your uh, professional associations deal with it as well, uh, protest when this is happening, uh, make sure it remains out into the, into the open. And then one thing which is very helpful is to, in one way or another, uh, to provide funds in order to have these educational programs, to develop these applications for smartphones and, for, and, and these uh, websites on, on the computer. Because this is really, the, I think, the, the best way to, to, to go about at the moment. Robert Van Voren, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome.